The Florida Historical Society presents Florida Frontiers is made possible in part by the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund and by Florida's Space Coast Office of Tourism, representing destinations from Titusville to Cocoa Beach to Melbourne Beach. The Space Coast has a diverse 72 miles of beach, including surf towns and sea turtle nests. We have inspiring attractions, including the Kennedy Space Center, Brevard Museum of History and Natural Science, and the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. More information is available at www.visitspacecoast.com. Florida history and culture from the Ice Age to the Space Age is on display at the Brevard Museum of History and Natural Science, located at 2201 Michigan Avenue in Cocoa. The museum has nature trails through 20 acres of three Florida ecosystems. The People of Windover exhibition features information about Florida's prehistoric past and actual artifacts used between 7,000 and 8,000 years ago. More information at brevardmuseum.org. Welcome to Florida Frontiers, presented by the Florida Historical Society. I'm Ben Broatmarkle. Stetson Kennedy began his career in the 1930s and 40s, documenting the diverse cultural heritage of Florida. He was also an activist working for positive social change until his death in 2011. Many of us who knew and worked with Stetson were inspired by him. Peggy Bulger was the state's first folklorist, serving as folk arts coordinator in 1975. From 1976 to 1989, she was director of the Florida Folklife Program and created the Florida Folklife Collection. Bulger served as Folk Arts Director and Senior Program Officer for the Southern Arts Federation in Atlanta from 1989 to 1999, when she then became director of the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress. Since 2011, she's been back in Florida working with other folklorists throughout the state. Bulger is author of the book, Stetson Kennedy, Applied Folklore and Cultural Advocacy. Well, when I first came to Florida, I realized that the only really uh, comprehensive cultural uh, documentation work that had been done was during the WPA, during the Federal Writers Project, where people all over the country were sent out to talk to everyday people. And so I started going to the archive, as you do, and found all of the materials I could on what was done in Florida for the Federal Writers Project. And I kept running across the, uh, the names that uh, still to this day resonate in the state uh, incredibly. Zora Neale Hurston, of course, was working here. Stetson Kennedy, um, Alton Morris. Uh, there were people who are, you know, legendary names. I kept running across their names. Well, of course, most of them were past <laughs> because they worked in the 1930s, and this was 1976, 77. And so I remember saying to somebody one day, I said, gee, you know, I keep running across this name, Stetson Kennedy. He did so much work. It's really too bad he's dead. And he said, he's not dead. He's alive and well and living in Jacksonville. And I, I you know... I was so naive, I said, oh my gosh, I never even thought that somebody who was working back then could be alive, but yeah, well, he's, he was younger than I am today when I met him, he was 60. And, but that was because Stetson was doing all that work when he was 21 years old. So anyway, I went over to Jacksonville, made an appointment to see him at Belutha Hatchie. He was living in a little A-frame house, and um, we, started a fast friendship. I started interviewing him about his work with the WPA and it just went on from there. I kept going back and there'd be another chapter of his life story that just was so amazing. I mean, I didn't even know about his work with the Ku Klux Klan or any of that when I first started talking to him. It was just about the Federal Writers Project. So, um, Needless to say, we were friends until he passed, um, so for years and years. I could not have written Emancipation Betrayed without 
Stetson's work. We could not have written Remembering Jim Crow without you know Stetson's example. He really you know set the bar for academic historians. I mean, there was a kind of a rediscovery of Stetson when I was in graduate school. So the books you mentioned earlier, Southern Exposure, Jim Crow Guy, Palmetto Country, a lot of those were coming back into print in the 1990s. And so everyone I know who did meaningful work on the civil rights movement or even U.S. Southern history writ large was reading Stetson Kennedy. The, the journal Southern Exposure was a key entry point for a lot of the academics who actually were my advisors when I was in graduate school. Because when you talk about Southern Exposure, the journal founded by, by Bob Hall, who knew Stetson and who was inspired by his example, if you look at the early contributors of that journal, you're talking now about people like Jacqueline Dowd Hall. Well, Jacqueline Dowd Hall was the president of the Organization of American Historians when I was in grad school. And so Jacqueline became this amazing oral historian in her own right. In 1937, Stetson Kennedy left his studies at the University of Florida to join the WPA Florida Writers Project. At the age of 21, he was named head of the unit on folklore, oral history, and socio-ethnic studies. Well, it was a, the Great Depression for one thing, and I didn't have a job along with tens of millions of other Americans. And uh, at the same time, President Roosevelt had organized something called the Federal Writers Project, and I thought this would be an opportunity for a 21-year-old uh, to start a writing career. So I signed up for the Florida Writers Project, and in a short time they did uh, elevate me to the, that position. I was wearing three hats. Uh, Zora Neale Hurston, as a matter of fact, was uh, my, I was her boss. She was not an easy one to boss, I can tell you. She fortunately worked out of her home in Eatonville, and I was in Jacksonville, so it was like that. Growing up in Eatonville, Florida, the first incorporated African-American municipality in the United States, gave Zora Neale Hurston a unique perspective on race. It was Hurston's lack of emphasis on racial difficulties that inspired Stetson Kennedy to make the issue a focal point of his work. To do free association with me and Zora, the first thing I think of is a little story she sent in. Said one day God was on his way to Palatka, and him and St. Peter was hoofing it, and it went on from there. <laughs> so she, everything she sent in was a, a real jewel. Uh, Alan Lomax was also a good friend of mine and colleague, and he said that in the field Zora was absolutely magnificent. He was recording in Eatonville with Zora in, as early as 35, and they went on out to the Everglades and then to the Georgia Sea Islands. Yeah, Zora was, was a mess. <laughs> uh, our politics uh, were very different. Uh, uh, she never turned in any black po protest law, for example. And of course, that was one of the very few forms that the blacks could protest. If it didn't rhyme and you didn't dance a jig the while, you were dead. Uh, but Zora chose to ignore all that stuff, and so I made it one of my specialties. From 1937 to 1942, Stetson Kennedy carried a heavy audio recorder throughout the state to collect and document the oral histories, tall tales, and folk songs of a diverse group of Floridians, from Seminole Indians to Cracker Cowmen to Greek sponge divers. Actually, it was a precursor to the uh, wire recorder came uh, next uh, before the tape recorder. And this recorder was like a, a coffee table, except it took two or three good men to lift it. When we wanted to go out on the railroad tracks or on the pogey fishing boats, uh, we had to get some manpower, and it was uh, on the tracks. It was powered by two automobile batteries. So that's, that's what we had to work with. I called it the thing. The recordings that Stetson Kennedy made in the cities, towns, and rural backwoods of Florida led to the classic 1942 book, Palmetto Country, an important social history of the state and its people. It was one of the first volumes in the American Folkways series, edited by Erskine Caldwell. And uh, we really pioneered in oral history. No one had ever heard of it at, up at that time, and talking about 1935 and six. I recall here in Titusville, uh, I, I was interviewing an elderly black man, this is a later period, and I um, happened to mention the moonshot. 
And he said, you don't believe that stuff, do you? And uh, I said, well, you know, uh, he said, it's just some more of that BS the government puts out. <laughs> it was an exciting, uh, you know, uh, field to be in. We, we had a lot of fun. Like, like kids on a trailer hunt, really. As a pioneer of oral history, Kennedy was pleased to see how the field has advanced in recent decades. Yes, uh, just recently at the Library of Congress, uh, they uh, launched something called StoryCorps, in which these streamlined uh, sound studios on wheels uh, are touring the country and uh, taking oral histories uh, from coast to coast. And they uh, honored me with letting me kick it off with an interview. And yes, indeed, it's come, come a long way. I, I'm a great believer in oral history because uh, I call it the dictatorship of the, the footnote. The, the academicians uh, are quoting each other you know, instead of uh, going out and getting first-hand primary source material. And the oral history, of course, is a participant and a witness, at least. And uh, they're, they're seeing it with all their sensory organs. And for that reason, it, it has more validity from my point of view. Some historians argue that oral histories are sometimes less reliable than more traditional research sources because people's memories are not always accurate. Kennedy believed that the best history comes from the recollections of everyday people. It's, it's uh, uh, being there and uh, telling history from the bottom up is, of course, history. It's the little man that makes history and not the generals. And uh, so I like to hear from the little man. Folk musician Woody Guthrie, best known for the song This Land is Your Land, was a big fan of Stetson Kennedy's work. Guthrie spent many of his last years living in Kennedy's house in Beluthahatchee Park. I recall Guthrie saying at one time, uh, Stetson's not exactly a folklorist, he's a po-focused, uh, by which he meant, uh, I suppose, a champion of the poor, uh, one of the folk, and not writing from, from some other point of view. Yes, Woody, I uh, spent a lot of time at my place up in St. John's County. And in fact, we just discovered 80 plus songs that he wrote in St. John's County, uh, all about my place and uh, the wildlife. And uh, I remember one song called Baby Buzzard. It says, Baby Buzzard, uh, look over yonder in that limousine, some of the rottenest stuff you ever have seen. And <laughs> So on, 80 songs here in Florida, and it was all new material for Woody. He was writing about, he'd pick up manuscripts. I was overseas, but he'd pick up my manuscripts and ended up writing, turning them, them into songs. And things like Chain Gang and Peonage and Sweat Boxes and things Woody had never thought about before. Uh, he made songs out of them. From his first book, Palmetto Country, in 1942, to his last book, The Florida Slave, in 2011, Stetson Kennedy focused on people who were marginalized by society at large. He interviewed and wrote about turpentine still workers, migrant farm laborers, and many others. Stetson was involved in Operation Dixie, which was the effort to really kind of organize unions in the South after World War II. Um, he was heavily involved in worker education efforts, and so he would put together pamphlets and broadsides and, you know, kind of trying to educate people about the difference a union can make in their life. And this is in the late 1940s. This was really edgy work in a state like Florida or anywhere in the South. So that's one example, but the, my favorite example, I think, in many ways is what Stetson was doing at the very end of his life. Stetson was heavily involved in environmental issues, and he, he had a deep love, but also a deep concern about what was happening with the St. John's River, you know, what was happening to, to Florida watersheds. And so he was constantly active in those issues, but he also was very active in supporting the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. Now, Stetson saw that group of farm workers in South Florida as a, maybe, um, creating a new kind of organizing model that he was very excited about. And the organizing model is something that Stetson was trying to teach us in the 1940s. That is, the organizing model of the Coalition of Immokalee Workers was to get consumers to think about their kind of implications in agricultural exploitation and to get us to pay, you know, penny pound per pound more for tomatoes. Um, Stetson was really excited about that idea. 
because, and I remember one time talking with him about this, um, he would appear at as many Coalition of Immokalee Worker rallies as he possibly could. I mean, here he is in his early 90s, and he's still out marching in, in, in Central and South Florida. And I remember one of his last um, speeches he ever gave, he got up in a flatbed, the back of a flatbed Ford truck. It was the end of a Coalition of Immokalee Workers march, and Stetson got up and gave this really passionate labor speech in Spanish. And a couple of my friends who were with me said, I didn't know Stetson spoke Spanish. And I said, well, you know, I didn't know either. <laughs> Isn't that really cool? But Stetson really wanted to learn the language of working class people. And so in, in a way, in retrospect, it's not surprising at all. Miseric Town is named after the founder of Czechoslovakian independence. And it was all Czechoslovakian chicken farmers, um, Lake Worth, 25,000 Finnish people. And so it's funny, Florida has whole towns where people, if they are in Minnesota and they have Finnish roots and they're gonna retire, they go to Lake Worth because they wanna be with the Finns. And so, <laughs> and then if, uh, you know, if you're Greek and you happen to be from New York and you're gonna retire to Florida, chances are you'll probably go to Tarpon Springs where, you know, you have uh, a uh, support group, you've got the food, you've got the uh, basilica, and the archbishop is there. You know, it's, uh, it's very interesting. It was Stetson Kennedy's infiltration of the Ku Klux Klan and other white supremacist groups that earned him national and international recognition. Using the name John Perkins, Kennedy was able to gather information that helped lead to the incarceration of a number of domestic terrorists. Kennedy shared the secrets he learned with the writers of the popular Superman radio program, which led to the Man of Steel battling the KKK during four episodes. These experiences also led to the 1954 book, I Rode with the Klan, which was later republished as The Klan Unmasked. I spent a lot of time in front of the mirror, you know, practicing the N-word and things like that. Uh, I didn't really have the face for it. In fact, I almost got killed. Uh, an interviewer came down from New York and I cautioned him about, you know, uh, blowing my cover. But he goes back and writes about this intense young man with a poet's face. And that almost got me killed. <laughs> there weren't that many of them in the Klan. As racial tensions were rising in the United States in the 1950s, Kennedy was having difficulty getting his books exposing bigotry published. The French existentialist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, best known for the play No Exit, published Kennedy's book The Jim Crow Guide in Paris in 1956. I first uh, infiltrated uh, during the war when the Klan was afraid that uh, President Roosevelt might uh, prosecute them under the War Powers Act. So they didn't put on their robes and they changed their names to various things like uh, American Shores Patrol and American Gentile Army and things like that, so that's how it all began. And yes, it's, it was exciting to put it mildly. Uh, when I went overseas uh, some years later, I thought I'd get away from my nightmares, you know, being caught. But in Paris, it was raining frequently and the French traffic cops wore white rubber raincoats with capes and hoods and their hand signals were very much like the Klan signals. So I kept on having nightmares. Although he never forgot his roots as a native Floridian, born in Jacksonville on October 5, 1916, Stetson Kennedy did choose to live abroad for about a decade. Well, McCarthy was going on. Uh, Eisenhower was president, and he was, as presidents go, he wasn't all that bad. But there was McCarthy. And, um, no, I went over to testify about slave labor uh, in the United States uh, before the United Nations in Geneva. And I went with a one-way ticket and eight dollars left over. So I was pretty much obliged to stay until I could, <laughs> and it took me eight years, so to speak, to raise the round trip home. Uh, during which time I saw most of Europe and North Africa and uh, across Eastern Europe as far as China. I was, I think, the first uh, independent journalist to get into China. And, in uh, 54, I believe it was. 
Harry T. Moore was an educator and civil rights activist who founded the Progressive Voters League, registering tens of thousands of African American voters in Florida. Moore was a statewide leader of the NAACP and fought for equal treatment for African Americans in the justice system. He endorsed Stetson Kennedy's campaign for the U.S. Senate. Harry T. Moore and his wife Harriet were killed when a bomb exploded under their home on Christmas night, 1951. I came back a decade or so later, riding around talking to people to Mims, Florida, where it happened. And there was this elderly black man sitting under a shade tree, and I walked up and asked if he remembered uh, the night. And he said, uh, remember? He said, how could I ever forget? He said, uh, sounded like a cannon going off. So I said to myself, uh, strange way to be celebrating Christmas night. Uh, Moore and I went back, well, I, I was on the Moore case before it happened, you might say. I had announced for the United States Senate as an independent, colorblind uh, candidate for total equality. This is 1950, when, uh, you know, it took a lot less than that to get you killed. And Moore's organization of, of black Floridian voters uh, called a meeting and invited the Democratic and Republican candidates and me to speak to them. And I'm the only one who showed up. And so they endorsed me unanimously. And so that's how it, it didn't really begin there because I had attended uh, meetings with more state NAACP meetings in Ocala and Orlando. Uh, so that uh, we were acquainted before that campaign. But I'm uh, always felt guilty that the feeling that uh, my campaign, his endorsement of it, uh, played a major part in getting him killed. Stetson Kennedy's legacy lives on in his powerful writing about Florida's people and the inspiration he provides to future generations of folklorists and oral historians working for positive social change. Stetson argued that you could, you could be, you know, kind of scholarly, but also at the same time, you could take a side. And that's the thing that I think Stetson taught generations of oral historians, that you can go into an interview and pretend that you're, you're non-biased, that you're objective and, and all that, and that's fine. But that was not for Stetson. You know, Stetson, you knew right away what side he was on. And I think he taught us that it was okay to, to make moral choices and not to separate moral choices from our, our kind of scholarly work. For the Oral History Association, we really treasure that perspective because we have so many um, of our members who do work in places like, you know, Palestine, South Africa, you know, the U.S. South, um, you know, Afghanistan, all over the world. And so by even going to these places, they are making moral choices. And Stetson kind of affirms that sense of, of right and wrong that we kind of carry around with us. And he urges us to take that sense, to take that passion into the interview, you know, with us not, and not to hide it, I guess. And so he's a very important figure in oral history. Here in Florida, you've got uh, History Miami has a huge uh, South Florida folk life program. You have uh, Tina Bucavallis, who is a professional folklorist working in Tarpon Springs, where it's a citywide folk life program. You have Amanda Hardiman, who is our new state folklorist, who tries to uh, make sure everybody knows everybody else. You've got um, Kristen Congdon and, uh, in Orlando. There are many people working, Bob Stone over in uh, Gainesville. Um, so people are uh, continuing to do the good work. There's never an end to it. I mean, it continues to grow. Uh, people move in, they move out. Uh, there's more things to document. But what I love is working with um, you know, the younger generation coming in, it makes you feel like, okay, you know, it's not just uh, that there was this blip in the 1970s where all of us now who are retirement age, uh, you know, that it, the work would just stop. No, there's, there's wonderful uh, young people coming in and, and taking over, which I think is fabulous, yeah. 
Stetson Kennedy was a writer, folklorist, and social activist who spent more than seven decades documenting the diverse cultural heritage of Florida and working to make life better for all Floridians. You've been watching Florida Frontiers presented by the Florida Historical Society. Visit us anytime on the web at myfloridahistory.org. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ben Brokmarkle. The Florida Historical Society presents Florida Frontiers is made possible in part by the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund and by Florida's Space Coast Office of Tourism, representing destinations from Titusville to Cocoa Beach to Melbourne Beach. The Space Coast has a diverse 72 miles of beach, including surf towns and sea turtle nests. We have inspiring attractions, including the Kennedy Space Center, Brevard Museum of History and Natural Science, and the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. More information is available at www.visitspacecoast.com. Florida history and culture from the Ice Age to the Space Age is on display at the Brevard Museum of History and Natural Science, located at 2201 Michigan Avenue in Cocoa. The museum has nature trails through 20 acres of three Florida ecosystems. The People of Windover exhibition features information about Florida's prehistoric past and actual artifacts used between 7,000 and 8,000 years ago. More information at brevardmuseum.org.